Greetings all. All right, so quick intro. We are moving on with the sequence of fire control switchology uh, as implemented in Steel Beast because it's the best sim I can find. And for the M60A3 TTS, I have enlisted the help of a chap by the name of Greg Pomelo. Hey, Greg, thank you. He's over at the US Army Brotherhood of Tankers. If you are a US Army tanker or mechanic, tank mechanic, you are uh, entitled to join this group. Uh, I should add, I think foreigners are also allowed, so go ahead and have a look. Uh, anyway, uh, Mr. Pomelo is a not only a dino tanker, he was a master gunner. Master gunners are basically the subject matter expert in the fire control system and weapons of a tank. So I'm rather uh, lucky to have him along. Uh, so without further ado, the M60 A3 TTS. All right, so here we are in our M60 A3 TTS. Good old fashioned MARDC color scheme. I always like that color scheme. It's lots of fun to paint uh, as a model. But uh, anyway, uh, let us get going with the TC's position, which is you have a look around the cupola. Uh, you see, I mean, it's a big cupola. We start off with the feed for the M85 machine gun that some people have very little to say positive about it. Uh, access for the ammunition supply. Uh, there is a last round override. So if you're down to about 20 rounds left, go ahead and flip your override and you can use that last 20 rounds. But it's a lot easier. So the 20 rounds or so will go from the machine gun up here to about here where you can where you can easily link in a bit more than 20 rounds. Uh, link in whatever it is that you're going to be adding in. A neat little feature is this. What we have here is a swing out seat. So when you are in the external position and you don't want to have to be standing on a platform down there, you simply swing out this little seat. You're sitting on this. It's uh, sort of a road march position. Lots of, uh, lots of fun very comfortable. Bit of a shame that the, uh, the Abrams doesn't have one of these, but on the other hand, it doesn't have this big, huge, stonking cupola on top either. Uh, there are basically two levels of controls. You got the cupola level and you have the, shall we say, the fighting compartment level. So let's hop back up to the cupola. We have a little unity site here. And as basically this uh, circle will show you when you go to the main graduated site, what the field of view is likely to be. Uh, this was almost never used apparently except maybe for some minor observation and if you did have to shoot infantry up really really close, this is the site that you could do it with. But realistically you probably wouldn't. There are two optics at this level. One is simply the infrared optic, which of course you can't use in the daylight, so we'll get out of that. And two simple adjustments there for the reticle or the brightness of the IR tube. And you can see also there are bore sight knobs here, so you can adjust the reticle accordingly. The sight for the caliber 50 is very, very similar to that of the Abrams that I mentioned before, the A1 Abrams with the commander's weapon station. And like the Abrams, you have power traverse, but you've got to manually increase or decrease elevation. Graduated scales, pick your range scale, say 800 meters, fire away, that's the end of it. Not much to be said on the caliber 50 there. Uh, you do have uh, your typical array of rather small periscopes around the side. And let us drop down to the main compartment level, which, as you can see, is much bigger uh, than in the M1. This really is quite a cavernous turret, although in fairness, it also has a much smaller cannon than the M68. Note the lack of any protection for the ammunition whatsoever. You may also, when you hop down into the driver's hole, uh, or correction, the gunner's seat, see the, um, see the bow stowage. And vertical stowage for the ready rack. 
The ready rack is more often than not, well, they call it the ready rack, in actuality this is mainly the storage for the smoke and the white phosphorus. Uh, and I believe HEP as well. Because uh, it had to be stowed vertically to avoid all the liquids that are inside from kind of settling at the bottom and it would unbalance the round. So if you stow the ammunition vertically, uh, the interior uh, fill of the shell uh, remains balanced. Ready bin for the coaxial machine gun, which you can see coming around here. Uh, by the time of the M6A3 TTS, I do believe they moved to the M240 from the earlier one. Now what you can see is they've, they've blocked off what used to be the coincidence rangefinder. So the rangefinder used to go from the blister on the right all the way across, right on top where the, uh, the loader is, to the blister on the left. Obviously, uh, that has been removed in the TTS because they have themselves a laser rangefinder. A little uh, protector there, just in case some shell casings come flying out far too fast, they hit off this and then fall to the ground. Where I do note a lack of a catchment device. So you, I guess you want to be careful as you're spinning around that the rounds don't go flinging off into the turret basket and get caught, which is uh, a question I never actually asked. Probably worth asking. Well, that looks interesting. I wonder what that does. I'll come back. Ah! I just saw the ammunition go flying by there, so you know which way is forward. Uh, again, this is another of those tanks where you don't need a turret clock for the TC, and indeed one is not provided. Uh, radius back. Uh, this apparently, I am told, is a box which contains the cards for the ballistic computer. So if you change out your ammunition types, what you do is you open up this box and you start pulling out cards. So they work kind of like the graphics card on your PC. They slot right in. So if you change the ammunition projectile type, they have a different ballistic uh, flight path. Pull out the card as well at the same time as you do this. And apparently this is more of the same. Cupola power, well that's obviously for the uh, TC's cupola up top. The master power is for the vehicle's electrical circuits as a whole, i.e. has the driver turned on master power. And of course we've got ourselves a couple of circuit breakers, one for the stabilization electronics. I'm told that if it goes, all you do is you flip the circuit breaker and hope for the best. If it still doesn't work, if it immediately flips off again, well, guess what, you got to uh, do some troubleshooting. And the power pack blower motor, which presumably is in the back of room, not sure what it does. Old J-Box Vic-1 system. Uh, let's see. This little device here, the gunner gets one as well. This shows you the, uh, the ammunition which is selected. And it doesn't see, okay, so it, the light isn't changing apparently uh, on this model, but it is certainly working because uh, up in the top right it says I've changed the ammo type. Moving or stationary. In theory, if you are moving around, uh, let's see if I can see this here. You are supposed to flip it from stationary to moving, and it's uh, it disables the cant corrector, which, by reputation, uh, was uh, was going to give you unre unreliable readings or sensings if you are on the move. So, in theory, if you're moving, you're moving on flat ground. The stabilizer is working, but the cant corrector is off. When you stop, you put yourself into stationary mode. The, uh, it seems that what you would do is you, you would uh, leave it in moving, at least if you're moving very short distances, like in a battle position. Commander's override handle does exactly what you think it would do. It overrides the turret, gives you control of the gun. And I am told that this is not the control for the laser rangefinder. This is what is equivalent to the dynamic lead. If you don't press this when you're tracking the target while overriding, the ballistic computer will not apply the correct lead and you will generate a miss. This device up here is all about the laser rangefinder, which of course uh, is in the right blister with its own little ballistic shield. So you bore sight the laser separately. There's a little counter here that says how many pulses have happened since the, uh, since the uh, laser was last refitted. 
there is apparently a service life on them. The actual site itself looks very similar to what you would find in a, in a regular reticle. Find your target, you can zoom in. There's one there, for example. And when you laze, you're going to get three returns. However, the problem is, because there's no lace button on the override, you've got to use your left hand. There is a blinking range button. So if the commander is doing the ranging, he finds whatever it is that he wants to laze on. Let's go back, I saw a target over here somewhere. Okay, there's a tank comes back out into the site view and he hits range. Haha! -ha. If you have it set for auto, what happens is that the three ranges that were selected, uh, correction, the last return goes uh, put straight into the ballistic computer. If you have it set for on, you will get your three ranges. Damn gunner is being too efficient, he's scanning. Alright. Let's try this again. Uh, I forgot to do that. All right, let's try that again. So now we should have a couple of ranges which you can select the first return, the last return, or the second return. And you can decide which of the ranges is most accurate. It's obviously not the 49. So let's go to the last return of 1980. You would then hit feed. And that would, you saw the gun jump, that sends the range into the ballistic computer. Now, because the laser rangefinder and the gunner's sight don't always line up, they're separate sights, what you gotta do is after each range, you have to hit battle range, which uh, sets, which realigns the two sights to 1200 meters. You hit reset to reset the laser rangefinder and the light is blinking laser rangefinder is now ready for the next laze. This does mean that the teeth that the gunner can't laze on uh, can't laze on his own because even after the gunner lasers, the TC still has to hit battle range and reset before he can range again. The pulse rate on the laser is a bit slower than that of a modern tank, so you've got to be careful not to burn it out, uh, or at least uh, give, give it a little bit of time to cool down. There is a TIS repeater, or TTS, as I to call it. And this, by the way, is a simple uh, holder for the rubber cover, which will be up here. And this toggle switch determines if the gunner or the commander is in charge of the polarity, the brightness, or the contrast. I think that's pretty much it for the TC's position. Uh, this is a stabilizer uh, deactivator. Uh, you tap, you hit this, the uh, loader has one as well, and it deactivates the... Uh, the stabilization system for the gun and I am told that really it was only you by the time you get to the TTS it's only used if you get a runaway gun such things do actually occur we had one uh, in one of my M1s uh, the Delta P had gone quite exactly what that does I'm not entirely sure but basically it sent the gun or the turret into an uncontrollable spin so if you, you quickly hit this you've deactivated the stave and you can set about troubleshooting So that's uh, pretty much it for the TC seat. Let's hop into the gunner seat. <sighs> Dome light. Uh, this apparently is for nitrogen. It's an input to purge the system. Azimuth indicator. Supposedly the central pointer always points to the front of the hull and looking as how looking at the ammunition at the front no 
Okay, I'm, I'm not reading this right. Somebody with more knowledge on the azimuth indicator can help me out, but it is used for indirect fire together with the elevation level here. As, a, as you can see, a conversion chart if you really are stuck with, uh, with doing maybe semi-indirect. Semi-indirect is when you're using indirect fire calculations, but you can personally see the target and spot it yourself. Uh, let's see, let's go over uh, the computer here. So you got the main power for the entire computer system. It's got self test, whatever. Note, you can input the air temperature and the altitude for the barometric pressure. Again, this will determine how, um, how the, the round flies. Toggle for manual or range finder. So if you move to manual ranging, you have this toggle switch here, which you set in range in meters, and you can uh, use a ballistic computer with that set range. Now it's basically, shall we say, the battle site range for, or the battle site button, shall we say, for the M60. The drift does need to be nulled out. Uh, so when your stabilizer is on, you got first of all you you power on the stabilizer first. You let it spin up for a couple of seconds. Since I just turned it off, it probably shouldn't take too long. You turn on the stab, hold down the Cadillac. The Cadillac, as you can see, very very similar to that in the M1, and then you null out your drift. The main turret power for traverse and elevation. It says elevation power. I'm told it does traverse for the turret as well is uh, again a simple toggle switch and it is possible to have although this uh, this doesn't model it the machine gun and the main gun can both be on at the same time if you do this the game won't let me do it but if you if you were to pull the trigger with both of these toggles in the up position when you fire around, you will not only fire the 105, you will also fire a burst of 762. Which will probably confuse anybody at the other end who happens to survive. They say what you do, the reason that you might want to do this is if you go down to a three man crew, let's say you've lost the gunner and you're down to the TC, the loader and the driver. If you select both to up, then the TC is capable of firing engagements. The loader, because both weapons are on his side, the loader is responsible for enabling the mechanical safety on either the coaxial machine gun or the main gun. So if the TC wants to shoot 762, the loader safes the 105 and vice versa. Again, we have the ammo selector. Uh, the light works on this one. Uh, so whichever what whichever end is uh, just been loaded by the loader, you push the appropriate button, and again you have this toggle for uh, your stationary or your moving. And uh, again, that's for the can't correct one. Uh, the Cadillacs, as I say, are very typical. You got your trigger, you got your laser button, uh, elevation handle. You can see here has again an electrical trigger. Uh, having a quick gander there, see what that does. The Master Blaster, crank this hard to the right, and a round is sent down range. Easy enough. Okay, so let's uh, hop back up here. We do have again a Unity sight with a very, very basic reticle, which you can shoot the 7.62 with. Lots of fun, doubtless. But realistically, of course, you will primarily, it, and of course, you can bore sight this reticle, which seems to be kind of pointless, but anyway. And you can, of course, engage with either the primary sight or the thermal imager. Thermal imager works the same way as you ordinarily would expect. So let's uh, find ourselves a target. Sure, there's one around here somewhere. There's one. What do we have? Nope, that's an M60. That will be embarrassing. So we line up the reticle, hit lays, 
Note that the range does not show up in the fire control computer. It is purely up to the TC to determine whether or not the, lay, the range is accurate. Once the TC has fed it forward and you're happy enough, oh that was wrong, uh, once the TC has fed it forward and uh, he's happy enough you pull the trigger and you miss. Let's try that again. Alright, much better. Tracking a moving target is the same as it is on the M1. So target is driving along, you track it for a second or two. Uh, once the system is in the ballistic computer, ooh, he dodged, nice try. Once the system is in the ballistic computer, the reticle will jump just uh, again as it is in the M1. When you're still happy, you send the ram down range. Look at that, he hit the brakes and he dodged me again. Ah. Oh, All right, let's try it again. There we go, target. And if you're you were too far for heat rounds, I guess, uh, if you're using heat reticle, obviously the, the reticle would jump further. If you were to go to the daylight site, which by the way, the, the minimum view on the daylight site is by six. Oops, wrong button. That's not right. I'm thinking of the TC's, the LRF view. That's got the target switch, doesn't it? But uh, daylight view is. Come anyway, on, did it again. As I'm ch pushing the different buttons. In fact, let us uh, let us forget that that engagement even happened. It does seem that you get a much better magnification in the thermal imager, doesn't it? easy ah. all right so again polarity control contrast brightness reticle brightness is adjustable um, hydraulic pressure gauge of course it's a hydraulic system now let's hop into the auxiliary reticle so I don't know if you caught it but in the M1 when you elevate and depress the reticle the, uh, the reticle actually rotates because there's a bend in the middle of the telescope in order to keep things convenient for the gunner. Uh, there is a couple of extra mirrors in the coax uh, or in the auxiliary side for the M60A3. And this means that as you raise and lower the reticle uh, or the entire sight picture remains horizontal and flat. The system has two reticles this is uh, either on the right hand side for APDS on the left hand side is HEP which the British will call HESH high explosive plastic and you can flip the reticle to a heat reticle which you would also use I presume for the machine gun you will note that there is no range scale uh, you're down to using either the size of the mills uh, of the lines uh, or taking the best guess. So let's go 1200 yards, see what happens. It seems we've gone over, so let's drop it a little bit. That looks like a target. So that is basically how the, uh, the 68 free TTS works. I don't think I've missed anything else obvious here. Uh, something that I didn't know uh, until Greg pointed it out to me. What we have here is a mechanical linkage between the gun and the sight, which is a problem because as you're moving, the gun is vibrating because it's a big heavy gun and it's, uh, it's fairly well attached to the tank, which means that the sight mirrors are vibrating. And the detached sight mirror such as it is on the M1 does not happen in the M60 which is a little bit of a flaw. Note the tanker holsters uh, worn on the chest to make sure that they uh, uh, they stay clear, they don't get snagged as they're coming in and out. Oh, I note the footrest here. It's uh, this little sort of bar, I guess you call it. Uh, it flips up and you can keep 
uh, you can keep your feet rested on that. So that is it for the TTS. Now what I'm going to do, because uh, I kind of gave the M1A2 short shrift. Oh, some, by the way, somebody wanted me to, to demonstrate what happens if I try moving, uh, moving engagement. Uh, there, there really isn't a hell of a lot to it. Because as far as the ballistic computer is concerned, if you're moving or if the target is moving, there's no difference. So I am now going to go 90 degrees to target against a stationary T-72 there. And it's exactly the same. You track, you laze, radical jumps, except it's a reverse lead. You send the round down range and you get your hit. Uh, then you dump lead and that's the end of it. So, as I say, I'm going to hop quickly now over to the M1A2. Uh, okay, so if, let's say your stab gets... Uh, that's weird. That probably shouldn't have happened. Or I got lucky. Maybe I wasn't going very fast. I'm uh, going to go back to the M1A2 and show you a couple of its tricks that I didn't mention before. That's a hit. Okay, the M1A2. Obviously, well, differences. We have ourselves an external caliber 50, a CITV, and uh, note the size of the periscopes around the TC's hatch. Lovely. So if you hop inside again, you do have the much, much better field of vision. If you compare this to the A1 video, uh, it's fantastic. Uh, but you will notice also that the Caliber 50 is a flex mount. Whoops. Let's see if this turns. Yeah, there you go. It's a flex mount with a good old fashioned iron sight. And you can just go haywire. Lots of fun. All right, so inside, obviously the TC has a couple of other little changes here. Uh, note, not least, the CITV screen and the battlefield control system. The CITV screen has a couple of modes, so let's hop into this. You can set it to manual mode, where you get to control uh, the position of the CITV which you would think would be obvious, but hey, there you go. In fact, let me again rotate everything to the left here. And because the CITV, of course, doesn't necessarily relate to where the turret is, uh, you'll see that there's a little turret clock. So the dashed line is the CITV, the solid line is the, the gun. So let's say I see myself a target that looks a lot like this. I can zoom in on it. And what I can then do is I can designate to the target, uh, to the gunner. So I designate and it swings around and the gunner has uh, had the sight, um, has a target in the sight. So again, let's say I wanted to go to a different, uh, a different target. Let's go over here, one of the BMPs. Note the position of the turret on the top right, I designate and it swings back to where my CITV is. Now again, the CITV has the same range of, uh, same range of zoom uh, up at the top right corner, three by six by 13 by 25 and 50. If I am feeling particularly lazy, I can just set it to auto and the system will slew itself left to right and I can just sit back, relax, and watch my TV screen and see if anything interesting pops up. It is possible to change how it works. So let's go to vehicle systems. Uh, and of course you've got your grid always shows up here as well. So let's go to CITV setup. You can adjust the sector limits. And it even gives you instructions on how to do this. So we place the CITV in auto, it is. I take 
control of the CITV, I go to the left limit, which let's say is over there. Whoops. Ah, hang on, let me, uh, let me get this right. Oh, I see. That makes it a lot easier if I zoom out. Okay, so let's go way over here for the left limit. I press the left uh, arrow button on the four-way sensor and note how the limit indicator moves to its new position. And the right limit indicator, exactly the same. Let's say the right limit is going to be straightforward. I push that and now the CITV is purely going to scan between that new sector that I designated for. Let's hit return. You can adjust the speed. And this is done by use of the up and down arrow. So that's as fast as the CITV will scan automatically. And you can slow it right down to a very slow scan, especially if you are uh, in, a, in a, uh, a higher zoom mode. which as you can see, even at the slowest rate of scan, this is pretty fast, at least in high zoom. But again, it's another reason why you might not want to, to uh, go into the highest zoom settings. Again, let's return. Reticle, symbol, brightness, uh, simple enough there. C3, this would be the Blue Force Tracker. We found it, uh, I personally found it most useful uh, to be navigating the unmarked roads on the map because there is a setting on the BFT that is basically a satellite picture. And uh, so by zooming in on that, I could tell exactly where I was. Now, if you wanted to slew the CITV to the gun, there are two ways of doing it. CITV to GLOS, um, it's kind of reverse. CITV controls the gun line of sight. So as I control the CITV, you'll see it scans faster than the turret does. So there's actually, whoops, that was a bit of a mistake. There's actually a little bit of a delay between when I line up on a target and when the gun catches up. Now it doesn't take a hell of a long time, but there is that delay. Or I can go to the, uh, the gun, uh, the gunner's primary sight controls the gun line of sight and the, the thermal imager or the CITV is basically locked in place, locked forward. And you cannot scan faster than the turret will keep up. Uh, the K means you got a K round selected. The square box again is ready to fire. Uh, the up and down arrow is MPAT air or MPAT ground. Battle sight is if your laser range finder is gone, just like in the M1A1. Uh, you can add or drop to the battle sight as, as appropriate. White, black, hot, uh, sensor, and so on. So the next option you have, so let me get this back into manual, is uh, if you've lost your LRF and you wished to get an approximate range, uh, let's see, I think I'll be in 13, yep. Yeah. I do. Okay, we're working higher. This box that just pops up, you can adjust the size of it. And whatever fills the box. So that's looking like between 22 to 25, let's say about uh, 2200 meters, because you got it, uh, it's the target is smaller than the box at 2,000 and it's larger than the box at 2,500. So out of curiosity, let's, uh, whoops, I should have designated instead. Let's bring ourselves back in, let's lace this target and let's see what the distance actually is. 1940, okay, I'll just this is why I'm not an A2 set tanker. Uh, but uh, that is the, the general difference with the uh, with the A2. Uh, Battle site ammo subdes is uh, that tells the 
uh, computer what exact type of ammunition you're firing for each uh, for each round. Analyze does it work? No. Uh, adjust to zero. That would obviously be done in, in conjunction with those. Let's see sensors. Need a. I have absolutely no idea what these do. But they're there. Maintenance. Uh, the A1 also has been upgraded with an electronic uh, troubleshooting system. Uh, that's what the AIMS stand for in Abrams uh, A1. It's the uh, Abrams Integrated Management System. Uh, the last thing I'm going to do, the last, shall we say, trick uh, up the sleeve is uh, shooting at a helicopter. So let me go find a helicopter. Alright, so let's find ourselves a kilo to shoot at. Chopper ready, stay below here. Fire! Alright, so we have ourselves a target. It is a hip. So I have impact in the tube. So let us select impact and air mode. Okay. Let's go back in again, find our target. You turn around. Once you laze, it'll start pulsing because it's in air mode. Hopefully, oh, this guy keeps bouncing around. And that was the end of that. So, obviously it's a proximity round, you just have to get close enough. I was trying with the hind a little earlier and it wasn't shooting down because the hind is armored like a damn tank and you need to fire Sabo or heat at it. Impact just doesn't do the job. Uh, or I guess you could do MPAT in surface mode. But uh, anyway, so that was the uh, that was the last thing I wanted to mention about the uh, about the A2 set. All right, so that was the A3 and of course the uh, M1 A2. Just a little catch up. Uh, again, if you have personal experience of using these things, with all little hints or tips that uh, perhaps we wouldn't be immediately aware of reach out to me and let's see what we can do. Uh, the CV9030 Finland is already covered. I've got a chap uh, who's a former TC of that uh, helping me out. And um, I think the next one I would like to do is the T72. Uh, so if you're a former T72 guy, hey, reach out and uh, let's see if we can do that one right quick before moving on to more modern vehicles. Uh, other admin notes, the opportunities to buy your Tank is on Fire t-shirt are running out. The, uh, the orders close at the end of March. And uh, yeah, and the book's still available. Anyway, that's it. See you on the next one.